two o'clock, so we can get started. Thank you all for coming. Um, we're gonna. I, I know you got a little agenda in front of you. We're actually going to deviate from the agenda a little bit first. I'm going to have Dave go first. So what we're going to do here today, I've got Dave Diogo, who is the communications director for Falmouth's new consulting communications. He's going to introduce himself a little bit. Obviously, Dave is a face that, in the event that there was some sort of large-scale madness happening, uh, he would need to be involved. So Dave's going to introduce himself real quick, talk a little bit about uh, what's going on down there, uh, what the future holds for them, what they've been doing in the past, and then I'm just going to we're going to talk a little bit about hurricane preparedness, and we're just going to sort of kind of spitball. I've got a I've got a pretty cool. Uh, I want to walk through with you guys about vehicle responses, and then Kim's going to talk a little bit, and then we can open it up. So, Dave, you want you want to start? You want to go first? Yeah, well, I have like six minutes to prepare here, but like I said, what I tell you, wing it, wing it, wing it. You'll be all right. I'm doing just as he said, wing it. <laughs> uh, my name is David Diago. Um, I was appointed as the communications administrator July of last year, which in my eyes was way too late. <laughs> Remember, you're on TV. Um, they appointed me at just the right time. <laughs> uh, anyway, the um, the town had a vision to uh, to do this consolidated dispatch center way before my time. There were some ups and downs and lefts and rights, and um, the ups and downs still continue. But I think we're we're trucking along where we need to be, getting all the departments on the same page. Um, what we do, what our purpose is, what our role is with uh, with public safety, with the town, um, as well as the neighboring towns. Um, we um, we were fortunate to where the town wanted to basically spare no expense with with the uh, the technology, um, the computer systems, the camera systems, radio systems, and uh, and everything else involved, which I think plays a vital part of, of what we do for the town. Um, we don't just dispatch for fire, we just don't dispatch for police. We, we police fire, EMS, um, animal control, the harbor master, um, we reach out to the Coast Guard, we take phone calls from everybody involved within the town, DPW, um, you name it, um, we answer the phone for it. And from there we, we triage the calls and, and put them out as, as we need to, like any other dispatch center. Um, however, Falmouth is, is very unique. I, I hear Falmouth Factor all the time when I'm trying to uh, overcome some challenges, um, and that's uh, that's been right on the right on the money. So um, there are a lot of challenges, um, a lot of different ways to do things, but everybody comes together. They come in with their own ideas, and, and what we do is we share the ideas, and we somehow make it work, and, and it's and it's working very well. Um, just to overview what we've done since we opened, which was February 1st of this year. Um, till this day, we've uh, we've answered the phone 52,000 times. That's how many phone calls have come into the dispatch center since February 1st. Um, and out of that, we have dispatched 22,000 radio calls to whether it's police, fire, EMS, and all the other departments I've previously mentioned. We are extremely busy. Last month was um, was our bit busiest month, uh, right at about 10,000 phone calls for the month. Um, that is a lot. So far, that's been the highest month, followed by um, August thus far. Right now, we're at 9,000 phone calls. When we first opened the center, it was 6,300 phone calls. So we've we've gone up 4,000 phone calls in a matter of six months. That's a lot, um, a lot for this town. Um, it's not a bedroom community anymore. It's a town that's lively and open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. This is not a summer cottage place anymore. Um, and I've learned that, and I've only been here a year and a half. So, um, you know, the services are there. Um, we do our best to do what, what needs to be done in the interest of public safety, and uh, and that's what we do. So you can wing it. We good? You can wing it with the question. Outstanding. Any questions? <laughs> Even better. <laughs> Thank you for having me here. So, Thank just for yeah. a little, no, that's okay. Yeah. No, just for like a little, so, nothing really has changed in, in Falmouth, as, so, as far as, uh, who is your 911 calls? The, this call center is not the public safety entering point. Our PSAP is still county. I, and uh, they, Hopefully there's no plan to change that. It's a pretty good system. So it's really not that much different than it was before dispatch left uh, our building for fire dispatch and moved down. When you call 911 in Falmouth, you get it, it entered by the Buffalo County Sheriff's Office. And they'll say police, fire, or medical. Depending on what you say, they one button transfer that call. That's still the same. So nothing, so you, your experience, or the public's experience with what, you know, when you're making a 911 call, <coughs> really isn't, really shouldn't be any, any different. 
uh, and there really, you know, there's no plan to change that. So a couple of, uh, next gen 911 is coming up, which is okay. more, people shouldn't really notice a big difference. It's more of the ability for the 911 center to track people, to be able to find you. Right now, though, there's a, little misconce a lot of misconceptions out there that if you call 911 on your cell phone, you can't be tracked, you can. There's longitudinal latitudes, there's ways that things can be triangulated. The next gen 911, unless I'm you know, the county guys would know better unless I'm speaking wrong. The next gen 911 makes that a lot more efficient. It, it does. And it takes the uh, the GPS coordinates immediately from the phone and are automatically maps it for us. Um, it's, there's several different ways we can do that, but now with this new next gen 911, it's going to be instantaneous. Um, it's not a feature you can turn off on your phone. You can't say allow tracking on the phone. You can turn it off all day long. When you dial 911, the federal law is that your GPS coordinates come along with that phone call. It's been kind of an expensive transition for the state, and it's being rolled out in stages. Some parts of the western part of the state have rolled it out. I was at a chief's meeting this morning with a representative from uh, uh, Tom Ash from the county sheriff's office that I think Boston, the Boston area went live with it yesterday and had some glitches, but not. But it's they're rolling it out in a piecemeal fashion, and I think that we, 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 this we, ours right. is uh, either the second or third week of October wow. uh, is when we start rolling ours out. We've had they would have been sooner, but. The federal land out there at the county is having them jump through hoops with some licenses or something to that effect to run the lines or something. So that's what the holdup is right now. But um, it is going to be a great piece of equipment. Um, now, now speaking on the whole 911 system, there there was a lot of frustration with with 911 and what people were anticipating was going to happen when they call 911. They thought they were going to come get us directly, and that is far from the truth. If you're dialing 911 on a cell phone, you got to contact state police first. State police then transfers you to the county, and then county finally gets us. We're your third, number three, to contact, unfortunately. Don't know why that's the case with the whole new next gen 911. You would think they would eliminate one of the middle people, but it's it's not going to happen. We don't know why, but a lot of frustration was was uh, was shown a couple uh, months ago at one of the uh, uh, selectmen meeting with concerns on why it takes so long, and it it could take what upwards of two minutes before we can even dispatch a, a, a cruiser or, or a fire apparatus or an EMS unit to you because of them delays, in my opinion, are unnecessary delays. But it's the state system and that's the, that's the route they wanted to go with, unfortunately. But, um, but it's improving, the technology is improving. Um, our CAD system is also improving um, along with the whole next gen system to where if you have somebody who doesn't know where they're at, um, and they don't call 911 because they still call the 1212 and 2323 number, we can ping that phone with our CAD system now. So it pings them a little uh, icon, they click on the icon, and it'll give us the exact coordinates of where that person's at. So we're, we're, we're getting there with the technology. Um, I think we're far along more than most, um, thankfully, but uh, it's what the limitations are of the system, unfortunately. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, since we have hurricanes on the agenda, since it's getting to be hurricane season, I stole this real quick. This is a little video that the county put together about sheltering. It takes a minute, I thought, if the sound works. Life is great on the Cape when everything is flowing smoothly, but sometimes daily life gets disrupted especially when bad weather comes in with heavy seas and the wind really howls and the rain pours down flooding roads and basements or a brutal February nor'easter buries us in snow and cold. Through it all, your family is safe and sound at home. And then, oh no, the power goes out. Now home may not be the place to be if you don't have power. Where can you go? You and your family are in luck. The Barstable County Regional Emergency Shelter System is up and running from the upper to the mid to the lower and outer Cape. Now you and your family can find shelter from the storm. Remember, the emergency shelter is not a cruise ship. It's a lifeboat, nothing fancy, but it provides power, water, and food, a place to sleep, housing for your pet, and emergency medical care. When you choose to go to a shelter, pack as though you're going on a three-day trip. Bring items for personal comfort and hygiene, and this is important, don't forget your medications. When you can't stay home and you have nowhere to go, remember the Barnstable County Regional Emergency Shelter System from the upper to the mid to the lower and outer Cape. Visit bcrepc.org 
for all you need to know about the Barnstable County Regional Emergency Shelter System. Just thought that was pretty cool. I, I they initially rolled, kind of rolled this thing out. I not really a big fan about the concept of opening the shelter so that you can charge your cell phone and have words with friends. Like there's got to be a little bit more to it than just being a power outage, especially in the summertime. But overall, I thought that was I think that the phraseology about it's a lifeboat, not a cruise ship, is something that is kind of an important message for people, <coughs> you know, out there in the world. I just want to find one. There's just a couple of the things I want I want to touch on. Most of the couple of things that I really want to touch on briefly are more sort of probably less for the people in this room and more for the people in the TV audience, but we have sort of just, uh, you know, the, so far the Cape has sort of uh, dodged the bullet as far as, is this the right map? Yeah. Um, you know, we just had Hurricane Jose that we had all kinds of conference calls going back and forth on and weren't really sure. Uh, what direction? Yeah, I, I have found this map site 300 times in the last week, and now I can't find it. Hurricane inundation maps. So we sort of dodged a bullet, and we dodged a little bit more of a bullet with the other storm because uh, Jose was kind enough to keep Maria off, for the most part, helped to keep it off, uh, off offshore, and not really affect the Cape. So I kind of did a little. I was kind of doing a little research in the in the storm surge, and, and on some of the regional meetings that we I've been to in the last couple of months. Listening to Franco Laughlin, who's the county uh, the REPC meteorologist, like I call him Nostradamus, the guy's just so smart and so spot on with his forecast. And he's always reiterating the fact about storm surge and hurricanes, especially hurricanes, although we, you know, you do get storm surges in northeast, or northeast, northeast storms in the winter, <coughs> is that it's almost always the storm surge that kills people. It's not the wind, it's not the flying debris, although those are all big problems. It's always the storm surge that traps people in their houses, and it's, storm surge is always, always the big killer. So I started thinking about storm surge and and Falloth, and I started thinking about, uh, you know, if I I've had to someday make that decision to be, you know, about what we're going to evacuate or what areas of town we were going to evacuate, and I've sort of had in the back of my mind since I've been the fire chief and the emergency management director that. My experience with Hurricane Ball, which was a Category 1 storm, that's sort of my experience with being in Falmouth. You just think, well, eh, Category 1 storm, we could get a Category 1 storm. Yeah, I could get a Category 2 storm. The chances of getting anything above a Category 2 storm, this is my thinking, are, my minimizing, about, are pretty slim. And then I started to do a little more research. 1938, the 1938 hurricane that blew up this way, that killed several thousand people in New England, put downtown Providence, Rhode Island, under six foot of water, was a Category 3 storm. And I started thinking, boy, you know, so the chances, and if you believe Al Gore, the chances of us getting a, a Category 3 storm now are greater due to the warmer water temperatures than they, than they ever have been. And I started thinking about how could I apply that to here? And I started looking at this, at this map, and there was some really eye-opening things that came up on the hurricane. And this is, a, this is right from uh, maps.gov. This is right from MEMA's website. So not only, and, and you can see the color, the color, color it's pretty self-explanatory. The color categories up on the top. For category one, two, three, and four, up on. This is pretty much what you could anticipate for storm surge to be in the event of, of a hurricane. And, and I started looking at this more closely and thinking, well, and there were some things that really sort of jumped out at me. Obviously, you know, you look down in Woods Hole, and you know, Woods Hole for the most part, even in a category one storm, Woods Hole's underwater. Um, and for even some of the areas that aren't going to be underwater, they're going to be surrounded, right? They're going to be they're going to be they're going to be isolated. This was a great visual to me of some, some of the problems that we may have in Falmouth. And I was hoping somebody maybe somebody would know there's some other things I'd like to point out too. But so you look at you look at this map of Woods Hole and there's some areas in there that even in a category four storm aren't going to be underwater, but they're certainly going to be islands. And I and, and I want to get that message out to the to the people you know that, that watch on TV, but at least to all of you people who are the stakeholders that have you know, have to make evacuation decisions, whether it be who, whether it be the hospital, or whether it be, you know, uh, a, you know, God forbid something emergently with the schools. Some things that you really have to, that we really need to consider. I looked at this closely about, uh, you know, where the fire stations were located. Found this in actually 
pretty good position. This headquarters station is vulnerable to probably a Category 3 or Category 4 storm. The West Falmouth Fire Station is vulnerable in a Category 2 storm. Uh, one of the, the, other, the other document I'm going to talk about uh, afterwards briefly kind of addresses some of those things, but it was just kind of an eye-opening thing to me. And I actually spent a lot of time in the last couple of days looking over this map and some things that really sort of jumped out at me. So you take portions of Route 28 and, and you know, in T-Ticket in East Falmouth, the East Falmouth Fire Station, even in a Category 4 storm, is in a, is in a uh, gray area, so it's not likely to be affected by storm surge. But if you look at Route 28 here, so this is Acapescat Road, uh, uh, Maravista Ave, Acapescat Road, you got the East Falmouth Fire Station sitting right here. That's Route 28. So what, what condition is Route 28 going to be in as far as being able to navigate those two low areas in a Category 1 storm? You look at the low areas like that, that still flood in a thunderstorm by Mill Pond and areas down by Rainey's Corner. So even though that we're in good shape as far as being high and dry as far as the apparatus goes, those roads could potentially be in a relatively in a, in a relatively weak Category 1 or Category 2 hurricane. Those sections of Route 28 could be underwater. And I think that that's something that all of us, everybody, in, in, that you know, if you're in this room, you're in this room for a reason, are some of the things that we need to consider and that we should look at. And this is, and I just sort of point this out, this is straight up mass.gov, it's straight off MEMA's website. It's an interactive map. There's a section down here where you can you can download these by community in PDFs. In fact, Bob Shea doesn't know it yet, but he's going to make me another one of these updated on a big, huge. I, I, ha I already have it. See, look at that. There's two Notre Dame's. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, and, and, and I've, I've seen these before. You know, we've had them here. I've, I've looked over these quite a bit myself, but it, it sort of, it was a, having these two sort of threatening storms back to back, Kind of, kind of, sort of piqued my interest in, it. and it's a really great resource for everybody. If you get a chance to just sort of take a look at it, this is zoomable. I'm not great at zooming it, but this is, you know, this is. It gives you an idea with the color coding that how much of the the coastal area of Falmouth is, could be potentially threatened by storm surge, and storm surge always is what is what kills you. Storm surge is what gets people. This is a, this this PDF version of it is really good because, like, I, because it maps up some of the infrastructure. It maps up where the fire stations are, maps up where the schools are. So even though you people would tend to look at this and say most of Falmouth is, is in the clear, the main routes of travel could potentially be th really threatened. And that's something that all of us that are in this room, I think, have a have an interest in. Chief, I think you and I have both looked at these maps before. The main routes of travel are also in jeopardy, but one of the things we look at when you look at that, those are high residential <coughs> areas within the town of Falmouth. So as far as evacuating yeah. people. And stuff. Right. There's a big concern there too. You know, I, I, I looked at, I looked, I think I can zoom it in that well, but I did, you know, I looked up at, I was going really sort of over an inch by inch, and I looked up at some sections of New Silver Beach that in the summertime are packed with people. Absolutely, you know, houses all close together, lots of people living in there. There's a big section of New Silver Beach that could potentially be dry, but it's going to be four feet of water completely all the way around it. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And 28A is vulnerable too. It'd be just like 28. Chief, oh, I was just going to say because we talked about uh, storm, storm surge, and a lot of people will say, "What's what's a foot or two feet of water going to do when I'm five foot or six foot tall?" The problem is, is that in, in six inches of running water on, on a surface can knock a 200 pound man off his feet. So that's important. The other thing is, electricity and water don't go together. So you get a foot in your house, and you get electrical appliances and things that. You could, things can go sideways really quickly. That's the danger, because people are just saying, well, two feet of surge water, I'm five foot ten, I'm good. No, there's a lot of dangers that are involved. Uh, the other thing is that you see these cars on TV, that the water's just moving them like they're, they're rubber duckies. And people get stuck in them, and the engines bog them down in the front, and they sub, they go underneath the water. And the water pressure on the doors are so great that they can't open them up, and that's why people drown in them. More people die in flood-related incidents for natural disasters than any other thing whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So it's important. That, and I'm glad that you brought this up because, as you can see, these GIS maps uh, that they're coming out with, these spatial maps that they're coming out with, are so much better today than they've ever been. And the technology is just getting greater for 
people like all of us to use. Yeah, I mean, the more I poured over it, you know, I, and what, what just happened in Houston, there was a, a Houston police officer, <coughs> a veteran guy drowned in his cruiser on his way into help in his car. Well, yeah, we just think. We're fortunate down, down there they had an alligator in someone's house. So you, yeah. animals come out as well. So. Right. Rev? Just a question. How, does, how do these maps reflect access to the shelter? Well, uh, you know, they, they reflect, that's a good question. I don't know if I have a specific answer for that. They reflect I mean, can people access. Still, I mean, can people still get to it depending upon where they're coming well, from? Well, you know, my, like my, my famous phrase, evacuate early, evacuate often. You've got, to, right. you've got to be out soon enough, and that's the problem. That's kind of what I was hoping to get that get the message out to people. And there's some other important messages in this next document I want to talk about. But that's really, that's really the key is that if you leave before this storm surge, everybody can get to the shelter. You got to be there before the water is pouring through your through your, through your so front door. Born did uh, born the town of Bourne went through a uh, tabletop exercise at Mass Maritime Academy, and with all the new inundation mappings, they realized that one of their pre-staging places up at the Upper Cape Boat School, uh, they would have a hard time getting their rescue apparatus mm -hmm. out of there because at certain tide levels and certain uh, hurricane strength. The roadway on 6A down in front of the school would flood, mm -hmm. and they didn't realize that. it was a great lesson learned. So, well, I mean, we've uh, we've identified informally in our conversations with about this about this in the last year or so that the the, the, the West Falmouth Fire Station for us is probably the most vulnerable as far as floods go, and that we would move that truck to the high school, and the headquarters fire station in the event of a Category Three storm, if it was, we would do the same thing. We we would move our apparatus up to the high school. And so that's a decision that you have to make sooner than later. And that's, that's kind of my point with all of this is that you don't want, you know, I can, I, like I said, I reflect back to Hurricane Bob where um, uh, some, some people in New Silver Beach decided they want to have a hurricane party until the storm surge was moving through the first floor and then they wanted to get out. And I mean, and then we went up there and tried to get them out and it was not pretty and, you know, there was ground ladders put up. The first thing out the door was a golden retriever out the window on the second floor and the guy was going to take my dog. And, you know, and it was very, very dangerous. So I just wanted to point out, even if, you know, to anybody that's watching, there's some really some eye-opening stuff about how far, uh, how far inland some of the red goes. You know, that's the almost in Hatchville of the Category 4 storm, areas that are subject to flooding. But the areas, you know, these kind of these tricky areas along Route 28, which are our main corridors, really jumped out at me that a section of road that we think is, you know, the main east-west portion of travel for us, and, 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 and like Bob mentions, Route 28A north-south. I've always sort of thought if, you know, I had to make a decision about, a, about an evacuation, it would be inside, you know, I would say, look, if you're inside of Route 28A, if you're on the water side of Route 28A, you know, to not break it down into if you're on this street or on this street, if you're on this side of Route 28A, you have to evacuate. If you're on south of, uh, you know, pick one of the peninsulas, south of Randolph Street, south of halfway down Davisville Road, the areas, or even south of Route 28, if it were that case, to sort of make it into a kind of a, an easy thing for people to understand. But the, and the other thing, too, again, though, that really jumped out at me was how much of sections of Falmouth are potentially not subject to the actual flooding, but are going to be completely isolated. And that's stuff that people up there need to know ahead of time. Chief, you know, during Maria in Florida, they stressed the point that after a certain amount of time, we're not coming to well, get you. hold that thought because we're about to talk about that. <laughs> so again, this is right off of, this is, it's MEMA. I Googled MEMA hurricane maps and it's a great, it's a great resource. There's all kinds of stuff on there. The last thing I want to talk about, touch on briefly, is a, uh, we've discussed, and, and a lot of this really pertains to the fire department. This is really, this is a, Kind of a consensus document that's been put together by the International Association of Fire Chiefs as far as her, uh, responses during hurricanes. And so this primarily does, does apply to the fire departments, but it's something that could potentially apply to anybody that's got a property or anybody that's got an interest in how they're going to evacuate people and how they're going to move resources around during a storm. And when I first started looking at this again, you know, over a year ago, my frame of reference is Hurricane Bob, where in the height of the hurricane, we were sending fire trucks out because there was a branch arcing in a tree. And it was insane. There were trucks trapped by fallen, there was an engine trapped for an hour and a half between two fallen trees. We actually had a member suffer traumatic brain injury 
out clearing a tree in the height of the storm. Went up to clear a tree, suffered a traumatic brain injury, never fully recovered. In the event, in the, so once our member suffers a traumatic brain injury, we had to have an ambulance take that injured member to Boston. Now that's an ambulance that's not available for the town. And I started thinking, you know, what's the consensus as far as the model, as far as, and I was able to find this. And, I, and same thing, I just, I just Googled IAFC, which is the International Association of Fire Chiefs, uh, hurricane preparedness, and this popped up. And you know, the Falmouth Fire Department is going to sort of adopt this in its entirety. And there's just a couple of points in here, and, and you, it's out there. It says for emergency, you know, public safety use only, but ignore that. If I can find it, you can find it. And it's just, I, I, it's, I, just, I literally, I just Googled it. And there's just some highlights that, again, that I just want to talk about. Like, like, like Bob had mentioned in, in the introduction, I, it, I was going to print this, it's 22 pages, so I was going to print a copy for everybody, but, you know, our paper budget. Difficult decision for an incident commander is to determine to halt emergency responses. Winds reach a certain force, debris becomes lethal, a lethal weapon that can cause decapitation, Whew. penetrate turnout gear, crush a person, person, injury or death. There's even a second here that even that Joe mentioned, I don't know, talks about uh, six inches of moving water can take an adult off his feet. So in looking to this for guidance, and some of this stuff, as you Google it, some of this, as you find it, some of this stuff we, you know, internally, we do. But one of the biggest things it talks about in preseason preparations, the second bullet down is update target occupancy list, which is something that we probably need to do a little bit of a better job. But it's something that you guys can do too, especially a, 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 an entity that's got responsibility for, for buildings and for people, is to update your target occupancy. What, where, where are the problems going to be? I think back to the... Admiralty apartments or the harbor when the roof blew off during Hurricane Bob. Um, whether it be a school, whether it be the hospital, to start thinking sort of too much before hurricane season, start thinking about what your target occupancies are. And like I said, so a lot of this other stuff we you know, we all, we already do, but if this doesn't just necessarily apply just to the fire department. Develop plans for the relocation of apparatus and equipment. Again. Like I, like I talked about, we talk, we, we're thinking internally about using the high school in the event, especially if the West Falmouth Station had to close due to flooding, they use the high school. Uh, you know, hopefully, I'm guessing the shelter would be up and running, and at least it's a space where our guys could get dispatched out of, the equipment would be safe, be high and dry. Basement storage, I think about this building downstairs, we've got so many paper records down there that some of which are on the floor. Is that something that we, you know, should, should be thinking about? If somebody from IT was here, I would ask them, what's the town's backup now for all of our electronic documentation in the event that there's some sort of massive amount of water? Where's it stored? I, I don't know. All things to think of. The thing that really jumped out at me, and it's, it's good that Dave is here, something to think about, update street maps due to the probable loss of signage and landmarks. And I go back to, we, we struggled during sticky snowstorms, <coughs> responding to routine calls when snow is stuck on the street signs and you can't see the street signs. And if it's snowing so hard that your GPS isn't gonna work. So that's, those are things to think about where we in the past have sort of taken a lot of old paper maps, map books, and just, ah, that's a map book. I got my iPhone, I got my MDT. Dispatch will tell me where to go. But if the street signs are all blown down, what are you gonna do? You know, to count 47 streets down Maribus to have could be a problem. So that's something to think about. Pre-designation of safe havens, Electronic equipment we talked about, and internally, but this is something you folks can talk about too. Like, you know, I worry about what are my guys going to do because they're going to be worried about their families. So if I'm going to have to capture guys and hold them here for three or four or five days or whatever, they're going to be worried about their families. The best thing that I can convince them to have their families do is for the families to get out of harm's way. And that's, and that's something that all of us can think about. If you're responsible for, if you're going to be trapped at work for three or four days due to a hurricane, you want to make sure that if you can, to have your families someplace where they're out of, they're out of, out of harm's way. And 
And now we're getting closer to the storm. For hurricane warnings, a lot of the stuff again, a lot of the stuff we do, change all the all the maintenance stuff. But notify the public if fire protection in a certain area will be compromised. And that ties into that ties into the next the biggest slide here, I think, which was shaded. And this is really what jumped out at me. And this is this is the model that we're going to adopt. So this is part that this is the part that we need to do that the Falmouth Fire Department needs to educate the people of. And, 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 uh, and again, my reference is back to Hurricane Bob, where we never stop moving. And the consensus now in across the country, which is a, which really jumped out at me, sustained winds of 50 miles an hour, sustained winds of 50 miles an hour and gusts of 65 miles an hour, the fire department's gonna stop responding. Stop responding. And that is, I think that's an enormous, that was a big eye opener for me. And I initially even thought, like, we had talked about this at staff meetings. I said, no, that seems like, that seems like a low number to me. Until you look down the bottom, when I get to the end of this, I'll show you the references. This consensus document was put together with input from Metro Dade, from New Orleans, Louisiana, from Galveston, Texas, from places that have had significant wind events in the last few years have put their, pulled all their knowledge together and they, and that's, this is a number that they came up with. I can't argue with that. I can't argue with the fact that a 50 mile an hour, a 65 mile an hour gust in Florida is more dangerous than a 65 mile an hour gust on Cape Cod. And, and, and that was really, that was really kind of an eye opener for me. But then you'll, you'll look back at, we can't help you if the truck is trapped between two fallen trees. If the track, truck is trapped the ambulance is trapped under a live power line. We can't help you with that. The fire department will discontinue response to all fire and EMS calls when sustained wind speeds reach 50 miles an hour or wind gusts are over 65 miles an hour. And that's, uh, that's just something we need to get the word out. We had a winter storm not too long ago then. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're talking about hurricanes, but this is not necessarily, this is New England. Yeah. So, you know, Florida doesn't get winter storms, but we do. So, you know, this is something that is not necessarily strictly related to, you know, three months at the end of the summertime. This could easily crop up with a big northeast storm in the middle of winter as well. And this, like I said, this is, this, this is the response model that we're going to adopt. Again, like Joe mentioned, you get a little bit farther down, things you didn't consider, or that I didn't consider as much. Six inches of water can knock a person off their feet. Be aware, we, be aware of hazards in the water, such as down electrical live wires. I, I've seen people walking down Shore Street in Falmouth after a tropical storm with trees laying down, walking with their kids to go look at the beach, pushing wires out of the way to duck underneath them. I've seen it with my own eyes. <laughs> we were fortunate during Hurricane Bob and the electric company at the time just dumped, I mean, just dumped the county. Just, I don't know what Eversource's plan would be now during the storm. I know there's significant repercussions for that with them. So we were a little bit lucky during Hurricane Bob because Eversource or Nanstar at the time or whatever they were at the time said, Calm Electric said, you're, you're all good. We, they just shut it off. Whether or not that's going to happen again, I don't know. They still say any down absolutely wire, right treat it as absolutely it's right so. you're absolutely right you don't know whether or not the guy down the street has got his generator running and plugged into his dryer circuit and it's back feeding yeah. and there could be electricity even though the even though the formal grid is dumped there's more and more generators out there generate electricity will kill you just as quick as as, as you know ever sources electricity so that's a really good point you know, when you talk about walk before you walk through water, use a pipe pole to sound like we would sound a roof. Things you don't think of is there. A, even though you're in, you're in knee deep water now, you could take one step and be in eight feet of water. Mm -hmm. Be aware of hazards in the water, down electrical, down electrical live wires, and wildlife, including snakes. That doesn't keep you from walking through the puddles. I don't know what will, but if I, if I could use this threat of snakes to get people to evacuate, I'll use the threat of snakes. I have no problem with that. Snakes come with hurricanes. So those, those are really just sort of the highlights in this document that I, that I wanted to cover today. And, and again, a lot of that, you know, and then how we resume operations, you know, once somebody gets to make the decision that we're gonna resume operations, 
there's some guidance in here for how to do that. But a lot of this just kind of talks about what's a what's a wave, what's what's a tropical storm, and so forth. But I, again, and there's some great resources down here as well. And and this is where you know this is I, I can't argue with the expertise <coughs> of the New Orleans Fire Department that has guidelines for their people about what to do in a storm. They they live through you know, they suffer through one of the great storms of the century. Again, Miami, Florida, Virginia Beach. This is just this is just it's not my this is the consensus knowledge. So. It's, I, I, International Association of Fire Chiefs and Hurricane, you should be able to, it should pop up if you want to take a look at it. Again, a lot of it relates mostly to the fire department, but there's good pieces of it that any stakeholder in this room could certainly plug in. So, questions? Anybody? Well, we, what you talked about is a, obviously incredibly important. How do you get this knowledge out to the public so that the public ahead of time is aware of these conditions, which should encourage them to go to a shelter early. Well, there's going to be a huge hurricane inundation map up at the uh, emergency preparedness fair. And again, right? Six foot by six foot. That's what we do just fine. <laughs> and, and, you know, and again, you know, this is this is part of it. Yeah. This is kind of part of it. You know, uh, to get that word out that you know, in in, in the event that we were getting that close to a storm, we would publicize this to the best of our ability, every place that we can, and this is going to sort of, this is going to be our guideline as far as, you know, and I think there's going to be some, you know, heaven forbid we get there, but I think there are going to be some people that are surprised when they call up and say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm having just pain, and we're going to have to tell them, sorry, we'll come get you when the storm's over. The biggest uh, thing we had with uh, Jose was a lot of people run out of oxygen. Yeah, not preparing. They have a little bottle, you know, their, their machine, but power goes out. They have a, a two hour supply of oxygen and that's it. So that they're, they're not educated themselves on what they should do to prepare for three, four days worth of oxygen tanks. And these companies are more than welcome to, to stock up on it. You just got to set up the, uh, the program with them so you can have the oxygen. But I think that's uh, one of our biggest problems that we're getting during these storms. You know, and the, the key though, you, I can't overemphasize this enough. The key for a storm of this scale is to evacuate. Not a shelter, not that the 911 genie is going to be able to come get you. That you've got to evacuate. And you're going to, and people have to start planning for that place to go now. You know, the counties, the county REPC there, May is, is, is hurricane prepared in the hurricane prepared this month. You know, and, but that's you, people have to start making plans for this way ahead of time, and that's the kind of the word we're trying to get out. And that's what we rely on, on you. Even then, if you're lucky enough to shelter in place after the event, you get through unscathed, you're stuck because right. our our response is going to be incredibly delayed because it's just not get back on the road and head down the road. We're talking from the pictures, you did, power lines down, trees down. We get bogged down in just a, a, a good nor'easter snowstorm now. It's labor intensive just to get an ambulance to a house. And that's during the day, how about at night? And that's during the day, and, and it's, it takes a lot of resources. So if, if everybody's thinking, okay, now the storm's over, I can get some help, or I need water, I need food, even you getting out of there, the hazard with the down limb, you're not driving out, you may be walking. Where are you gonna go? You Down, down limbs, hazards, power lines, gonna treat them live. So. My family's going to Vermont when this happens. Seriously, I mean, yeah. it's already been discussed because yeah. I know where I'm going to be. I'm going to be stuck here. My, my wife's going up with... So this, those are things people need to discuss now when you see these events on television. You need to be thinking about that happening here because it's been a long time. 38, 44, and 56, I think. With a, I mean, Bob, to me, was from what my grandfather says, Bob was a... I know you don't agree, Chief. I wasn't here. I was on the ship, but it was like... It was a walk in the park. Yeah, no, and grandfather talks and, about, and, and that's yeah, and, and that was bad. That is still part of my frame of reference. Is it? I thought Hurricane Bob was, I mean, where I lived in Mar Vista was seven days without electricity, Monday to Monday. I thought that was, whew, and this was days before you couldn't live without a cell phone, you couldn't live without a tablet, and you know, never mind. And, and but you hear people, the old timers talking about people <coughs> that have been through much more powerful storms in other parts of the country. Hurricane Bob was a sneeze compared to what a Category Two or a Category Three storm. Could potentially produce so and those few excuse me the few storms that we've had <laughs> where we had the warnings and everybody brought everything in i remember about 
2009 or so. Back then, we had a few storms coming our way. We we were getting we had people on the beach, up and down the shore route. You know, we, we took a break and we turned around and left, and people were walking down the beach to check out the ocean. No word of a lie. And we turned around and left, and they were driving their cars down the shore route, and we left. <laughs> You know, because they um, we, common sense is not necessarily common. <coughs> so when you talk about common sense, even with the, with these recent storms, it's what's more important: finding a place to charge your phone or grabbing three days worth of water. It's always let's charge the phone first. Nothing right. more important no. than a salty with the wave <laughs> 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 you know, You've Gotta have it. So uh, I think. Well, we just kind of go around, but I know Kim wanted to talk. Kim went to a uh, conference recently. I think the Reverend was there. A lot of children in emergencies. You got anything you want to say? Yeah, perfect segue. Actually, the deputy was talking about having a family plan. So um, on Tuesday, the Southeastern Regional <coughs> Homeland Security Advisory Council put on a children in disaster all day conference. And there were some great speakers. Um, we actually had the Office of Refugees and Immigrants, um, Riverside Trauma Center, Boston Children's Hospital, Director of Disaster Preparedness, the Executive Director of Western Mass's um, EMS, and the topics included the impact of trauma and disaster in children, reunification issues with children and their family members, as well as children with complex medical needs. and. You know, so there was a, a, a lot of thinking points, and we always go to these conferences, and, and as the chief is saying, or and when a situation arises elsewhere, and we look at our own surroundings and how those effects can um, be applied to what we have as far as resources and what we don't have. And, and so I took a, a close look when I got back at you know, okay, well, what are our, our demographics with regard to children? You know, what do we have in our own community that, that we would need to look at? And found that in our 44 square miles, we have 43 licensed children daycare centers, so that's almost one per square mile. They house approximately um, just under a thousand children. Now, some of these are mixed, fam what they call family daycares, which take in anywhere between six and 10 children that are not school age, and um, up to the larger group in school age locations, they comprise 792 um, occupancies, and these are primarily before and after school care, kids that are in preschool, so slightly older. But I had a conversation with a woman who was sitting next to me who was a daycare provider, and they have, um, 35 children under the age of four. And she said her hugest concern, even though they have an emergency plan, they have to in order to uh, renew their license each year, but the one piece that is really weak is their transportation piece. How do we get all these little kids that, that are in need of um, car seats into some sort of vehicle or vehicles and transport them to wherever we, you know, we have a few different places depending on the nature of the storm, so to speak. And so I thought, hmm, when I get back, I'm going to have to try and make arrangements to have a meeting with our child care and daycare facilities just, just to have this conversation. It, because I know a few years ago, when, when we really first started getting big from this department, I had a conversation with two daycare providers, and they both had um, the same location they were going to the rec center and the rec center is not open the same hours that the daycare is open so it was a lesson learned for them so would love to have that conversation with them <coughs> so it was a lot of great information you know those those conferences usually are you, you pull some pieces that you can at least bring home reevaluate look at what you have in place one of the, the other pieces that I brought out of it was that we're actually in, in a great spot with regard to what we have done for the children in our community with our sheltering. The, there are a number of different communities that don't have the capability of breaking up their shelter components so that families and children are in one area and the general population is in another area. We do that very well. We're, 
thankfully we have the capabilities at the high school to do that. And we also have age appropriate items. Um, and so I think that you know we are in a very good place, not that we couldn't get better, but it was nice to hear that we've at least been proactive with regard to children. One of the other pieces that I think we will have to look at is potentially having someone available in the shelter that would have specific training with regard to children in trauma because there was a very large piece in that and that is a piece that we don't think about. So that will be something else that I'll, I'll be working on. I can follow up with some folks that do that specifically. Right? Perfect. I, I have a question. I, about two years after I started serving in North Falmouth as their pastor, I found out that there was an MOU with the local elementary school. And so, which surprised me because I had no idea that the church was supposed to, you know, should something happen at the elementary school, that the church was the place that the children were going to go to. And I'm bringing this up to say, I, I wonder um, if those relationships need to be uh, reaffirmed. I mean, if I didn't hear about it until two years after I got there, I mean, any given church could have gone through several pastors or that whatever, that whatever committee runs the church, they might have no idea if something happens in a local elementary school that, that they're supposed to go to some place, or even the school may not know. Interestingly enough, better late than never, they give you Bob Griffin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the school did know because they were going to set up the MOU. Um, we figured that North Alabama Fire Station wouldn't be big enough to house North Alabama Elementary School. And we figured that the church was the only building nearby where the kids could walk to and have some sense of security. So when Karen Antonucci was, in, Karen Carson, was the uh, principal in, in North Falmouth, we went over to the church and walked through the church and, and uh, talked to the members of the church to see what, if we could possibly do that. So we did set up the MOU. We've tried to do that with other places as well. Um, for example, T-Ticket School um, goes to one particular place. Um, uh, I'm not concerned that you did it. My concern is that I think periodically we should be reaffirmed. It. Yeah, that's that. That makes sense, um, and and I can continue to do that. Do Just a, a follow up on many of Kim's points. That um, one of the reasons Bob and I are here today was to sort of uh, coordinate with uh, with folks in this room. The, the a list of things that you just read off are things that they, we've been focusing on over the last year in the schools. So we need to we need to uh, coordinate uh, some meetings to make sure that uh, we're communicating with you about some of the plans that we've been making in the schools. So it, it's almost the exact same agenda. That, yeah. So, the, the, yeah. the two things that Pat said. One is the the aftercare and recovery we've worked on. We've got a whole part of the uh, comprehensive emergency plan we're working on and that's to take care of the kids after an incident and the other thing was an extended um, opening of the shelter after five days or ten days is it all going to be all still volunteer help and what effect will it have on the school system closing schools and also maintaining the building mm -hmm. well we've been fortunate not to have to even think about that with regard to long-term events because and that's not wood are, find some real wood right yeah. our, our events are normally well, you know short-term um, what we have done before was we've relocated you know those last few shelter residents uh, who just did, had not had the power restored to their homes and we've worked very closely with you know with the power companies to ensure that that they were put a little higher on the priority list as well so, um, but one of the things that they're talking about in, in this particular piece is also the return to normalcy. And, and you hear that an awful lot with, with the, you know, Texas and Florida is that not only for the kids, but for families in general, they need that return to normalcy. And part of that piece is getting back to school. And, yep. and they, they had a piece on one of the news shows that down in Naples, they were out of school for uh, for 11 days, and there was there was a residual effect on the children because, you know, they needed to get back to that normalcy. So that's a great piece for the conversation. 
Hi, I'm Susie Houghton with the Human Services Department, and we've had conversations with, I don't know if that's what you're referring yeah. to, Charlie yeah. Jodwin um, and Joanne Sykes about, at least within the school department, there's a comprehensive emergency management plan, but what hasn't been in place yet is a behavioral health response plan, and so how to have a separate plan with partnering with the Human Services Department and other mental health providers to have a coordinated response to disasters and tragedies and have everyone potentially the idea is to have them trained in psychological first aid so everyone has the same approach to responding to any age group but um, that would tie in so I think future meetings will be happening on that effort. Great. Anybody else? Go around the room. Hooey, Ron Reeves, modest guy, Hooey. Anything going on down there? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't think so. Okay, moving on. <laughs> All good. Oh, good. It usually is. And you weathered the storm well. We, we yeah. Are, yes, we did. Yeah. yeah, we did. We did. Uh, we did move hazmat off the dock, and we took. We, we wasted some money, but it's. Uh, it was something we wanted to do, and secure hazmat moving to higher ground, but, and uh, so. But um, uh, we are going to have a. Um, the fight space rescue drill this fall. Oh, no. Specifically for the fall, so perhaps now the fire rescue department can participate. Um, yeah, but we uh, kind of fumbled that last year, so we won't do that twice in a row. Just send an email, Ron, and we'll try to get the shift on duty down there. And we're having a new space. It's going to be uh, the Clark parking lot, um, you know, where the McLean building is and where USGS is. <coughs> yeah. There's a space there right on that, that corner of the Clark parking lot. We checked it out, it's about eight feet deep, so we'll be able to put a, um, a volunteer in the sked and drop them in, go rescue. Terrific, Kim. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All set. Uh, actually, Eric from oh, yeah. said he was going to go <laughs> yeah. He's great at volunteering, by the way. Wear your, wear your dirty clothes that day. <laughs> MBL, the poster child for Sprinkle Systems work. The fire went down there last week, hallelujah. Sprinkles work great. The fire in the lab, it would have been 50,000 times worse than it not been for a sprinkler system. So, Port Cap and Port still there? Oh, the I heard you on the conference call. Well, the ferries running? No, the, the generators are running. The ferries are not running. That was a great line. <laughs> that was a great line. So, anybody? Anything else? Mel, go oh, for it. Real quick, uh, Boyd and I were at the, the senior center open house on Monday. And it was pretty well attended. We had a table there. We handed out some well, fire prevention information and also emergency preparedness stuff. And received a couple of complaints uh, about one issue, which was the, the website, the town's website, looking for you know, postings from about the, the recent storm, Jose, and that people usually in the past, it was up front. They, mm -hmm. There was a lot of information. They couldn't find anything. So Did you, have you heard those complaints yet this week? Because we Yes, we, we heard them Monday. We worked on that extensively to try and get that stuff. Or on the front on the front page. This was right this was top of the front page. Eventually, and I thought we had yeah. solved that. So I guess that's well. This we, was we, we can look into that. This I was thought, Monday. Yeah. Afternoon. So I thought I thought we had I thought we had fixed that. But yeah, that's good to know. We'll we'll. It wasn't easy. Whatever. Yeah. One one person there wasn't easy to find, and mm -hmm. I guess they were used to seeing everything right up front there, and it was they couldn't find anything. You know, we and, and, and this was something that that I have to own. I mean, we do a really good job on social media with getting the word out on all the between police, fire, communications, between emergency emergency preparedness. But for people that don't have social media, and that, and, and that was and that sort of kind of jumped up at us. And we but we did a lot of work to get that. We thought we got it on the front page of the town website to make it easier. But that's certainly something that we can. That we can look at before the next, before the next time. Yeah. When's the emergency preparedness fair? Is October? Yes. Uh, Saturday, Saturday, October twenty-first is the fifth annual emergency preparedness fair. We'll have about you know uh, fifty vendors or informational tables there with some great information, free fun, free food. There'll be free raffles. If you finish our passport, you get you'll take away. Um, uh, something special. We have the touch a truck component outside, and again, it's at Gus Canty Saturday, October 21st from 10 to 2. Parents Weekend at the University of Delaware for the second year in the room, so have fun. Okay. Anybody else got anything else? Okay. See you in 31 days.
30 days. Thank you.